Welcome everyone to Farsight Space Group. We're really excited to have Ekaterina Salvikova here today. She will be discussing lunar explorations, challenges for a long-term sustainable base. Thank you so much for joining. We will have hopefully a lot of time for Q&A, but for now, please take it away. The, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm sharing the screen. So again, thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Ekaterina Sertikova and just before starting my presentation, I would like to say that, as you know, today is the International Day of Human Spaceflight, and we celebrate to honor the first person, Yuri Gagarin, to go to space in the year 1961. And, you know, this flight brought the beginning of the space era for humanity. Uh, and today, in my presentation, I would, look, I would like to do some kind of a progress check for lunar exploration to discuss where we are now, what are the challenges we face, and how we are trying to solve them. Um, in the background, you can see a screenshot from the Apple TV Plus show for all mankind. If you haven't watched it, I strongly recommend you to do it. And I put this picture because I hope that we will also reach uh, the milestone showcased in the For All Mankind show. So let's start. Okay, where we are now. So currently we have two big lunar exploration initiatives. So one of them is our Artemis Accords, led by the US. 47 countries have already signed up for this. And another one is International Lunar Research Station that is led by China and currently have nine countries that are signed up for this initiative. We have this division, not because of some technical reasons, but directly because of the established political alliances. And this leads us to the fact that we do not have a single global lunar exploration initiative. We spend our resources on two big projects that are basically aiming for the same goal. And since the goals are quite similar, there is a potential for conflict or disagreement, at least say. And this is because both camps would like to station at the same area, almost in the same area in the South Pole. You know, they would like to use the space resources, conduct mining and manufacturing activities. Of course, it doesn't mean that the conflicts are going to definitely happen. We can still try to find a way to collaborate. <laughs> but on a positive note, right now we have already five countries who made a soft landing and the commercial space age is finally here. So what are the challenges that humankind needs to overcome to build a truly long-term sustainable lunar base? Of course, we will not be able to cover all the possible challenges today in detail because there are a lot of them, and I hope to showcase at least some of them. And if during this presentation you will learn about a new challenge or a new initiative, it will be a win for me. So, yeah. We will start from with lunar transportation. Of course, having a launcher and a lander that can deliver your crew to the moon is the first step. I propose to consider, let's say, like three different phases to lunar orbit, then from lunar orbit to lunar surface, and the mobility on the lunar surface. In the first case, when considering the transportation to lunar orbit, of course, there are several critical challenges. We need a heavy lift launcher. We need to minimize the cost. It should be preferably reusable and like for, with minimized fuel consumption. We need to provide a high launch frequency, basically start the mass manufacturing. And of course, the vehicle should be able to be adapted for a variety of missions. Right now, the USA has a SLS, which is actually a really good launcher, but it doesn't respond fully to the challenges like high launch frequency or cost minimization. So if everything goes well, the USA will have a starship which should provide the answer to these challenges. When we consider the transportation from lunar orbit to lunar surface, we can certainly mention the challenges like, you know, the land for landing precision, safety, because the moon is quite rocky and we certainly need autonomous capabilities to help with it. Of course, there is a need for thermal management, radio uh, protection and life support. And of course, for usability, flexibility, and we also need to think about the dust damage. Do we need to have a landing pad, for example? There are two projects that I would like to mention. First, the Starship HLS, which is currently in development. So the maiden light should happen in 2025. And it will be possibly used for Artemis 3 and Artemis 4 missions. I hope so. Fingers crossed. Another project is the integrated lander vehicle, which is built by the national team. And it was selected as a second lander by NASA. There were a lot of news how it was selected. 
So yeah, I think everyone knows about it. And speaking about the surface mobility, we certainly think about environmental challenges like temperature, dust, radiation, navigation, hazard avoidance. So it's important for the rover to have also a reparability capacity and of course enough power to be able to displace the crew for long distances, but also autonomous capability. So NASA recently selected, I think maybe two weeks ago, something like that, they selected three companies to advance Artemis lunar rover designs. And so I'm showcasing only two just due to space limitations, but NASA picked the team led by Intuitive Machines, Lunar Outpost, Venturi, Astrolab, or basically it's Lunar Terrain Vehicle Services Contract. These rovers could be used starting from Artemis 5 mission, and the rovers would be uh, provided as a service. So basically the same way the agency procuring spacesuits and lunar landers. What is really interesting is that NASA really expects to have some autonomous capabilities like teleoperating operating the rover. So for example, when the astronauts are not present. Okay, let's go next. So communication and navigation. Speaking about challenges of for com communication and navigation, we of course have a line of sight limitation. So basically the right communication for Earth, uh, with Earth is only possible when the rover has a clear line of sight to Earth. We have a signal delay, we have micrometeoroid and radiation, and of course, the lunar dust. Lunar dust potentially can cover, you know, it can cover and potentially damage your com communication equipment, such as antennas, and basically will reduce the effectiveness. And unfortunately for now, we don't have a GPS or similar infrastructure for determining positional velocity orientation. And very harsh terrain, again, with greater rocks and dust. Also, navigation systems accumulate errors over time and require periodic recalibration and gazing on position. And this is also one of the challenges. So on the right side, at the very end, you can see the architecture for communication navigation. So Gateway will bring connectivity in the S-band, the carbon. And, but I want to speak more about the Lunar Pathfinder, which is... The launch for this system is expected in the end of the year 2025, and it will be the first ever GPS slash Galileo reception on lunar orbit. And of course, it will also be used as a relay for the first U.S. lander on the far side of the moon. Of course, we can we should mention the LunarNet. LunarNet is a NASA NASA joint project and basically data network aiming to provide a lunar internet for cislunar spacecraft, spacecrafts and installations. It will also offer navigation services, for example, to, do, to determine the orbit, navigation, also on the lunar surface. So amazing. If you're interested, you can also check the Moonlight Initiative. It is a project, basically initiative, run by European Space Agency with overarching goal, providing support for space companies in Europe. And they want to create uninterrupted telecommunication satellite coverage between Earth and the Moon. So yeah, and basically trying to facilitate future lunar projects connected to the topic of communication and navigation. Okay, perfect. Then lunar habitat, of course, if we speak about the challenges again, this is the environment, temperature variations, radiation, dust, meteorite impacts. We also need reliable life support system, reliable power during the long lunar nights, reliable communication, of course, we, we need to use in situ resources for building materials, so we don't need to deliver everything from Earth. It's also important to work on addressing psychological stress during long duration missions, everything connected with mental health, group dynamics, leisure activities, and it actually also could be mitigated by habitat design. If we truly want a long term sustainable base, we need to aim for a scalable habitat that can grow with time. Of course, the base also should be economically viable, and we need international cooperation, especially in life-endangering situations. And there are several concepts I would like to show you. So the first is, of course, uh, the foundation surface habitat, which will help to establish, basically, research outposts on the lunar surface for the early Artemis missions. So basically, astronauts will be living there like for a month, maybe a little bit more at the time, it's still in the early stage of some of development. I think NASA is planning to basically complete everything by the end of this decade. Maybe I'm not right. But the, basically, it's like a, you can see a three-story structure. The bottom floor is like metallic model with an airlock. And the upper two are basically 
inside an inflatable volume, and it's a place for crew to sleep and work, live. Another two interesting projects I want to mention is Project Olympus by the architecture firm Big Space Exploration Architecture and Icon. They recently received a small business innovation research award. And these structures will be built using robots by using 3D printing and local materials. So totally sustainable. <laughs> and another project is Moon Village. It's developed by uh, Architecture Studio SOM and the European Space Agency. And again, it's a concept made of inflatable models. Let's go next. So of course, I serve you. Uh, of course, there are a lot of challenges and they are all over the full supply chain. It is identification and assessment of lunar resources, basically mapping, prospecting, and as basic access issues, resource extraction, it's machinery. It's also operating again in harsh environment. It, it needs a lot of energy. Resource processing, basically efficient processing technologies and waste minimization, infrastructure requirements, basically all the habitats, laboratory, storage facilities, everything that is needed. Logistics, we need to move the resources on the surface and equipment and also people. And it's quite hard to deliver, you know, this heavy machinery onto the lunar surface. So we need to find a way to do that. And another thing I want to mention is legal challenges. We need international agreement or basically for environment protection, sharing of resources and what to do in case of territory claims. Of course, it should be economically feasible. We need to have a market for lunar derived products. And there are actually a lot of public concerns. They can be right now, they're not too much, but it is the same case with mining and oil and gas industry on Earth. And I noticed a lot that space mining industry, they just say that they're going to accept the public concern and that's it. And I don't think it's the right way to deal with this situation. You need to try to do things in a sustainable way and have an open communication with public, basically. Let's speak about the companies. So first one, of course, Interlune, they claim that they have developed novel machinery and processes to detect, extract natural resources from space and bring them back to Earth. They say, like on the website, they say it's smaller, light equipment, deploying one launch requires 10 times less power than any other system. And technology uh, is pending for patent right now. Of, of course, you know, based on the, the news, the aiming for heaven free mining. Another company, Offworld, basically they plan to use swarm robots. They have like different types of robots, like surveyor, excavator, collector, hauler. And um, basically the whole excavation squad, and they are able to perform complex mining functions. And they also have an energy squad, the basically battery and charging station units that help, can help, you know, extend operational running time of each robot uh, by basically they can perform autonomous in situ battery swapping and charging. And of course, because this is a swarm robot, they can coordinate behaviors, optimize overall task performance. There are also several other companies. I'd like to say it is Astropor Space Technologies. So basically, they're going to build roads, landing pads, special dust-free zones for different kinds of operations. And there's this one, they're basically doing research via Ceru. They also aim for water extraction and regular processing and regular collection. Let's go next. Agriculture. Of course, we need to eat something. And what is really interesting, agriculture is always seen as a very well versatile field and technologies from space agriculture can be moved to Earth. Of course, main challenges like harsh environment, temperature, radiation, lack of atmosphere, lunar gravity, it can affect actually the plant growth, including root development and in general water distribution. Uh, also issues with access for, with, to water because you need to extract the water first. If you want to plant, to put your plants into the regular leaf, it can be a little bit complicated because there is no organic component. The dust is quite, the regular leaf is fine, abrasive. And of course, all of this can affect the plant growth. And agriculture, as I said, this is a critical component. So I want to speak with you about this space food challenge. Basically, this is an initiative that is run by NASA and Canadian Space Agency. Right now they are in phase three and I think yeah, they started like one or two years ago and they still continue. Basically, they 
just some companies that already will receive the prizes from NASA and will advance to the next phase. Well, you can see several companies here, like Air Company, that basically developing a system and processes for turning air, water, electricity, and ACE into food. There is Interstellar Lab. Uh, they create modular bioregenerative systems for producing fresh microgreens, vegetables, mushrooms, and insects. Also, it's not only for U.S. companies. NASA and Canadian Space Agency, they also selected three international teams that face two winners. And of course, those three teams are invited also to advance into phase three. For example, you can see there is a one company from Australia, Enigma of the Cosmos. They want to increase the efficiency of plants' natural growth cycles. There is Mycarina of Gothenburg from Gothenburg, Sweden. And there is also Solar Foods from Finland that create a system that uses gas fermentation to produce single cell proteins. If you look at the left, really close to this list, you can see Interstellar Lab. This is the moon pod, basically some kind of inflatable lunar automated greenhouse. And they are planning to put these pods not only on the moon, but also on Earth. For example, in the regions where it's really hard to grow plants, for example, the deserts or the regions where there were some disasters. And actually, I put one link for research uh, about plants. Recently, uh, the scientists tried to put the plants in Apollo and Lunar regolith. And it's actually possible. It's actually possible to gr for plants to grow in Lunar regolith. But of course, you can see the citation here. They were not as robust as plants grown in Earth soil, and even as those in the control group grown in lunar simulant made from volcanic ash. But they did indeed grow, and that's amazing. Surviving lunar night. Wait yeah, a second. This is, yeah. Wait a second. They grew. You can grow plants almost just in air. They don't need, Yeah. You know, you, you, what they need is carbon dioxide, sunlight, and some water and some trace minerals. So the issue yeah, it's is carbon. Yeah, of course. It's possible to grow plants without regolith or without soil, let's say. But it's also interesting to see that for a long time previously, we thought that lunar regolith is something quite toxic and it's not possible to sustain some life like growing plants. And that's really amazing research that's showing, okay, that's possible. Not good for, <laughs> but possible. Okay. Surviving lunar night is always the next challenge. It's actually one of the main challenges I consider together with uh, lunar dust mitigation. And it actually shows how mature your lunar program. <laughs> of course, for surface power systems, again, temperature variations. We have long lunar nights, 14 days. We have micrometeorite impacts. They can damage all the infrastructure you have. There is also solar radiation, that's cosmic rays. They can damage electronics. There's also dust. It's abrasive. It decreases efficiency of the solar panels. And we need to store the energy. It should be like high energy density, long life, the ability to operate in the temperature extremes. And what is also important is maintenance. Uh, we need to repair and maintain our surface power systems. Okay. So one of the things that I want to showcase is First is European Space Agency Endure program. Basically, Endure is for European devices using radio as a top energy. And they want to deliver basically European capability for radio as a top heat and power systems. They consider to do it by the end of this decade. If you followed the news for a long time previously, a European Space Agency was not fond of uh, nuclear options, let's say. They mostly considered solar panels. And it's really nice to see right now that they have this project. Um, and the system basically will be based on radioisotope fuel derived from rep reprocessing of nuclear waste. And the work will cover everything, fuel production, encapsulation, as well as the whole system development. Of course, ESA considers that it will be not only for the moon, but also a good step to development of the power systems for the exploration of outer solar system. And they consider that they will use this technology also on Mars. There is also another two projects. One is for closed loop regenerative high temperature protein exchange membrane fuel cells. 
It's again ESO with several other centers and companies. And there is another project that I want to showcase. It's Astrobotic. You probably already uh, have seen it somewhere for its lunar grid project. And basically they're using a vertical solar arrays technology. They want to capture as much light as possible at the lunar south pole. Okay, let's go next. Recycling and manufacturing. Oh, so again, environmental conditions. And because of that environmental conditions, materials will degrade over time. Of course, they also degrade on Earth, but maybe not as fast as on the moon. Of course, lunar gravity, it can affect how you separate or handle material. We need continuous power supply and efficient recycling technologies to resolve water scarcity. Water is essential for recycling processes on Earth. And if you want to use water on the moon, it can be quite expensive. And again, the behavior can be different due to lunar gravity. Cost, especially when you want to bring all this heavy equipment from Earth to the moon, it should be, of course, economically viable. It's how many materials you actually recycle. And for manufacturing, it's again environmental conditions, vacuum, and it, it's a physical process that rely on atmospheric pressure and presence of cases. Energy should be available. Again, lunar gravity, again, that affects fluid materials, dust. It's abrasive, finds that statically charged problems for machinery. Reliability, you need to be able to repair and maintain your equipment. Otherwise, you know, it's not sustainable. Transportation cost would be nice to have lightweight equipment, equipment and a of ownership resources right. Here you can hear, here you can see several companies like Orbit Recycling. They want to bring debris to the moon and recycle them. There is Redwire. They want to to improve infrastructure manufacturing with lunar regolith. And also Redwire, they actually have a lot of stuff. You can check on the website. They have a lot of experience in low Earth low Earth orbit manufacturing on board of the ISS components, bioprinting, so tissues. This is stuff they do. Lunar dust, that's really amazing topic and my favorite. So you can see how the lunar dust particle looks like. It's one of the particles collected during the Apollo 11 mission in 1968. So there's one difference between the samples. It's fine, it's coarse, it's abrasive. And we know that chemical composition is actually known to vary with respect to the landing site and the grain sites. It adheres to surfaces penetrate gaps in spaces in your equipment. It's very sharp, abrasive, and pose, of course, hazard not only to equipment, but also human health. There are electrostatic properties. Dust can become electrostatically charged due to the photoelectric effect from sunlight and interactions with the solar wind. And thermal properties, because dust has a high surface area to volume ratio, it can affect, of course, its thermal properties. And trivial charging or contact electrification when dust particles basically collide with each other over the surface of the moon, as well as equipment, habitats, you know, spacesuits used by astronauts. And you can see the cat. This is actually you in lunar dust. This is how everything gonna look like on the moon. And there are actually mitigation strategies uh, to mitigate the lunar dust. And usually the strategy consists of three components and you need to utilize all these three components together. For example, can be first operational and architectural considerations, like you need to move slow. Maybe you have specific dust trap zones or specific dust airlock. Uh, you have landing pads, or also distance between the base and the landing pad can play a role. If you want to look for the research for landing distance, you can check Dr. Philip Metzger, and this is his Twitter. <laughs> Passive technology, so basically brush wipes some kind of dust tolerant mechanism, nano coatings to stage carbon filtration, any cupped connectors, stuff like that. For example, here you can have a, you can see a solution, smart material solution. This is a company. What they did, they tried to have a smaller contact area for the materials, so to reduce adhesion. It's basically a non structured surface. And when we speak about active, uh, dust technologies, of course, the famous electrostatic and magnetic dust removal. It can be also compressed gas dust removal or dust vacuum. Here you can see electrodynamic, electrodynamic dust shield. So basically, uh, you create an electric field that propagates out like ripples on the pond. And this is how it cleans the dust. Uh, I think electrodynamic dust shield should have been on one of the eclipse missions. 
And let's go next. Health and medicine. Of course, uh, you want to survive as long as possible. And there are a lot of problems because of lunar gravity, like your know, muscle atrophy, bone loss, radiation exposure. We need to understand what we're going to do with the long-term impact of radiation. Uh, again, psychological well-being, like you need good psychological support systems on the lunar base. You need to prepare for medical emergencies. Again, with surgeries and everything. There should be supply chain for medications and equipment, reliable supply chain. And is it actually possible for us to produce medications on the moon so we don't need to deliver all the necessary stuff from Earth? We need to have telemedicine remote diagnostics. Of course, with COVID, it started and people started to use more remote calls to the doctor, but of course, it still needs to be improved. And of course, human factors and ergonomics, minus stuff like spacesuits, medical equipment, and living spaces, they all should be optimized to minimize physical strain and basically to improve the efficiency of daily tasks. And here you can see two photos. Right now, most of the experiments they are done on the ISS. We use microgravity to investigate different kinds of stuff, you know, starting from bone loss in space. For example, you can see the experiment that is run by Jessica Mayer. Or, for example, also trying to study airway inflammation that is done here by ESA astronaut Alexander Gerst. For example, it, when you try to study airway inflammation, it can also help not only your crew be safe on long-term missions, but also improve treatments for patients with asthma, basically every kind of inflammatory processes in your lungs. Let's go next. Both in is an example, knowledge transfer. So here, I really thought about the slide, and on the first picture, you can see it's written, Health to Health Clinics and Detached Rural Communities of Guatemala and Nicaragua. I contributed to this organization for four years as a development officer and fundraiser, so basically helping with everything, starting from grant writing to developing relationships with local clinics, organizations. And I can say that there are so many similarities. So based on my work, of four years, I can see how medical help in detached rural communities can be so similar to how you will deliver medical help on the lunar base. For example, when COVID started, all our supply chain, let's say, got canceled, <laughs> basically. And because this is a really detached rural community, you actually, there were quarantines and you cannot go anywhere and basically you encased in your small building and you cannot go anywhere, you cannot help your patients, you cannot deliver the medications, you cannot bring them. Everything is closed. So there are a lot of examples like this, how we actually can use Earth and ISS as an example. It is Concordia Research Station in Antarctica, that is in really harsh conditions. And we can certainly take into account how they provide and how they survive in this harsh environment. There's also mining industry, which is basically also doing the work in really remote regions. And they have a lot of expertise that can be transferred to the lunar mining sector. Of course, robotics and automation, we can uh, basically build the car with robotics without human help. Can we do the same on the moon? Can we manufacture something without even needing the astronauts to be close by and, you know, and looking for all of this? And of course, ISS, it's our biggest platform for running all the experiments, going through our operations strategies, and et cetera, et cetera. Let's go next. I also want to, to speak about information sharing, cooperation, and interoperability. So here you can see some initiatives, starting from LSEEC, Logic, there is also Gexla, there is Open Lunar, and for all mankind. And all of them, at some point, provide either inter interoperability or technical coordination, environmental protection, information sharing. And if you are really interested, I'm part of the GEXLA. And they have actually a lot of objectives, starting from leverage contributions from different kinds of like actors, like space agencies, private companies, academia, and any kind of international organizations, including public. They serve as a platform to exchange information and views within the space community on key issues. And they're trying to promote peaceful and sustainable operations. So if you're interested, you can check the recommended framework and ask any questions about it. Yeah. Okay. Lunar economy. There are a couple of slides left. 
So yeah, I'm not really an expert in lunar economy. I'm not economist, but I would like to mention here from the recent PwC study, of course, it's not really recent, it's 2021. But they see that there are several market drivers and several challenges. Of course, we have renewed geopolitical interest for exploration. We have increasing missions to the moon surface and rather than orbiters. And we want to support actually the involvement of the private space sector, including non-space companies. There are a lot of challenges like delays and potential cancellations due to budgets and certain things. I think it's like really the case for NASA. Every time the president changes, they come with the new goals and the change of budget, of course. And because the budget is approved every year, it's yeah. <laughs> There are also uncertainties during still early phases of technology demonstrations. You don't know if this technology is actually going to work out. Can you put it in your roadmaps and say that in the 10 years you can count on it? And Bill uh, WC study says that they consider that orbital payloads will remain non-negligible in terms of mass, but negligible in terms of market value in the coming years. And I also put a, let's say, table from Institute for Defense Analysis. It's the report, Demand Drivers of the Lunar and Lunar Economy. It was done in April 2020, but I don't think that a lot of things changed. They are trying to see what actually the, what government want, wants, what philanthropists want, and what actually a household like general public wants and businesses. So for government, of course, and philanthropists, they want human exploration of space, they want to see sustained human presence on the moon to lunar, and on lunar space, they want to see the performance of humans in space, and they want to test relevant technologies, uh, they want to study all these different challenges related to lunar science, astrophysics, again, putting the telescope there, and again, testing science-relevant space technologies. For government, it's also signaling geopolitical strength and national security, like lunar and lunar intelligence, surveillance, testing military space technologies, and they have they would like to have a permanent robotic outpost. For usual people, like for public, they are interested in lunar tourism, like surface and lunar moon rocks. That's really cool. It's really cool to have a moon rock. Any kind of lunar artifacts, basically object made of the moon and then to be sold on Earth, you know, any kind of jewelry or a souvenir. Lunar memorials. Do you want to put your ashes to the moon? Someone watch that. Uh, so the results, there can be a market for that. Of course, there are some ethical and environmental considerations. Uh, businesses, they would be interested in lunar advertising, any kind of virtual reality. They would love to see mining precious metals for sale on Earth. They want to extract helium free for sale on Earth. Manufacturing in lunar vacuum, because it can be quite beneficial to components. Hazardous waste disposal, of course. You live on Earth, you put your waste disposal on the moon. And another really interesting one, supercomputing and data storage. So I think it's really interesting to see this, what different kind of groups wants to do with the moon. Because we, the people who are engaged with space science, or space engineering, we not always see what the general public would like to see as the outcome of lunar exploration. This is my last slide, and I, I've listed so many challenges, you know, and they're all technical and sometimes societal and interoperability and information sharing, how we're actually going to work together. But I think one challenge that's actually main challenge and really long-term challenge, it's when you can call your base at home. You know, as for example, if there are some immigrants here in the room, you have how you had this feeling, you know, when you live in a new country, you try to get used to everything. And then at some point, if you're lucky, you can say, Yeah, I'm, I'm going home. And people will ask you, Are you going to your country to see your relatives? And you say, no, I'm going home to my home. And I hope that in some years we will have people who will say that the moon is their home and they don't see Earth as their home. Okay, that's it for me. All right.
that was uh, very interesting. So we have uh, yeah. questions in the chat, um, which we will get to in a minute, but I'm going to take my chair prerogative and ask a few things. Uh, one thing I want to just say, I think we might have had a discussion about this at an earlier space group meeting. I'm not certain. I learned this, uh, I think as a result of one of the earlier seminars, that there's actually the first U.S. nuclear reactor, the first new nuclear reactor that has gone critical and produced power in the first new design in 30 years, just got stood up. Sonny, you may know about this, at a NASA center. And it is mm -hmm. a all reactor that's, it's just a, it's just like a hundred kilograms or something like that. You're talking about the one kilowatt? Yes, that thing. Yeah. yeah, NASA has a program they spun out as a result of all that work looking for fission surface power. Uh, I think they were originally looking for a 10 kilowatt Lego brick. They've increased that since then to a 40 kilowatt Lego brick, although a lot of industry wants them to go back to the 10 kilowatt Lego brick because the size is easier to get on the shelf. Oh, but, the, but the impressive thing about it is that it actually got built, fueled, you know, approved and went critical and produced power. Yeah, uh, yeah, a, a breadboard version of it. Yeah, and of course, yeah. for example, during my presentation, I couldn't mention, because I have no access, to all the technologies that DOD or DARPA possess. I'm pretty sure there are other technologies that are not mentioned in the public space, of course. Harold, do you know the, na the name of this program that you were talking right now? Uh, I think the, the solution, the, so the NASA program that... Uh, Creon's talking to is Kilo Power, right? Uh, okay. We, and then a number of people were involved in that. But the I think the solicitation that's out that has result, resulted in some studies being awarded to a handful of commercial companies is fission surface power. That's the solicitation. It was originally written for 10 kilowatts. Everybody was happy with that. They had some weird last-minute change to 40 kilowatts. And so I don't know where it's at. I've lost a lot. Yeah, but the neat thing, but to me, and then we'll move on. The neat thing about it is that it's not an RTG. It's an actual fission uh, reactor. And it got approved and built and, you know, it, it ran and it went critical and it did, did everything it was supposed to. And the U.S. has not instantiated a, a new nuclear reactor design for decades, we've built some recent ones in Georgia, Vogel, and stuff like that, but that's an old design. That's a, a Westinghouse design. Anyway, mm -hmm. that's a separate topic. Of course, we, and as Allison pointed out in the chat, we actually had a talk about lunar work that would be enabled by this very program. Um, so then the next thing I want to mention before I throw it out to the general um, order is um, you mentioned two things, you territorial disputes and- yeah. And resources. Now, as I understand it, that's gotten a little more complicated recently because there's the Outer Space Treaty, which basically mm -hmm. says there can't be any territory, yeah. it's because there can't be any territory, but you're free to go and exploit where you are, wherever you land, you can mine, you can utilize resources. Has that changed? Have like countries, do you know if countries have been dropping no. out of the Space Treaty no. or what? That is with that is China part of it. Yeah, we have this outer space treaty, and I'm I cannot say that people are actually considering following it. Yes, it says that you can explore, you can try mining, but the question is, can you sell it? Because let's say you explore, but you according to the outer space treaty, you cannot sell it because the moon belongs to everyone. I don't think that's true. You cannot no. leave according to the outer space territory uh, treaty. You cannot claim territory on the moon, but it was explicitly written to allow for commercial exploitation. Um, okay. So people can make money on the moon. They just can't stop anyone else from coming where they are and doing the same thing, you know? And also yeah, they have it's true. people in emergency. They like, it's like the law of the sea. If someone's in trouble, you have to pick them up on your ship and you have to help them, even if it interrupts your commercial operations. Okay, great. So, Allison, do you want to manage the, the audience questions? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. We have tons of questions in the audience. Uh, a lot of them from Micah. Micah, do you want to unmute? Do you want to uh, want me to ask sure. you a question? Feel free to say so. I can ask great. one that I'm most curious about. 
Um, what is preventing us from just building a long train track around the pole and just setting up some solar panels on a very rudimentary train that just goes and follows the sun? It seems like the moon's fairly small, and if you're near the pole, you can follow the sun pretty easily at a fairly low speed. Is there something that prevents that? that obvious? Yeah, it's much stupider than putting a nuclear reactor, but anyway. <laughs> Could you please repeat, do you want to put solar panels where? And so let's build a train track around the one of the poles, oh. so like three, 300 kilometers or so, and then just follow the sun around so you don't have to deal uh, with the temperature fluctuations or anything like that because you're always in the same level of light a, all the time. That's really a nice idea for a sci-fi movie, but <laughs> I think... Uh, I think they've done a few, actually. <laughs> no, yeah, I don't well, think we're going to do that. Because you see, first, it's really hard for us to operate at the rims of the South Pole. Or, sorry, at the rims of the craters at the South Pole. Mm, and yeah. if you check the maps, you can see that, for example, the angles at which this, let's say, the angles of the slope, it will not allow you, I think, to build a railroad. Or at least mm, you will need to have some additional appearances, basically to make a railroad to have a flat uh, surface. It, it's expensive. It's expensive. Gotcha. It's better yep. to come up with nuclear options. Gotcha. This is basically, they're not nice, smooth paths around the poles. It's very yeah, rocky and not, lots of ridges like and everything. Gotcha. No. I have others, but I will let other people go. I think most of the other questions, as far as I can tell... Oh, Peril, go for it. <laughs> yeah, please raise your hand if, if you want. Uh, yeah, just a, something I've wondered about a number of times, and I, I think I've seen rare occasions where it gets discussed mentioning the rail, you know, the rail stuff made me think about it in terms of, you know, simulating earth level of gravity on the surface of the moon, right? You'd have some kind of rotating rail system or something of an appropriate radius and rotation speed. So that when you factor in the, you know, the moon's gravitational field and the rotational one, you get a, a, a 1G thing. Is there any current, I, I've only seen old research on that. I've never seen no, any. I haven't seen, I it, haven't seen current research, honestly. Uh, I know that recently it was a discussion, I think from NASA or DARPA, honestly, I don't remember, but they were, they asked some companies to try to come up with a concept for a railroad on the moon, but not in the concept as you're mentioning right now. So it was a simple railroad, I think something like, to when you can transfer the resources, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that, but not what you mentioned. No, I haven't seen that. All right. Are there any other questions? Feel free to raise your hand. Otherwise, Michael, you can uh, go again. Kriyan already answered this, but I'd also like to get your thoughts. Why is it that all the lunar habitats are always on the surface and never underneath mm -hmm. the ground? It seems like the ground provides radiation protection, some amount of meteorite protection, temperature stabilization. It, it is hard to dig, but is it that much harder to dig? And that's just the reason, or is there something else that prevents it? Okay, let's consider if you want to dig something, okay? You want to dig something on the moon. You come to the moon, you need to bring all your equipment. And most certainly people, at least a couple of them, you know, to supervise everything, you have nothing on the moon, okay? If you want to dig for a long time, you need to have power systems, everything. So you spend the time on setting up the whole system. If you want to also need to leave, they need to eat, you know? all of that stuff. And yeah, it's quite difficult. In terms of that, you need to, you know, modify all your equipment to be able to dig on the moon. Also, your equipment will be, I think, more damaged than on Earth, also due to the lunar dust. And when we speak, for example, about inflatable habitats, something like that, it's quite easy because you also can bring it on the moon. And that's it. You can assemble it and people can live there. But in the long term, yeah, lava chips can be interesting. And for example, when we look at the Mars research, there is a lot of research how lava chips can be used. But you also need to have some prospecting. Is it enough space inside? How many people it can fit? What is actually inside? Can you put everything there? How you seal everything? Um, you still need to seal the walls because everything like uh, lunar soil can be toxic for a person. There are a lot of considerations from different sides. I don't know what uh, Creon mentioned in the chat because I haven't... Uh... I just said that it's hard to make things underground because you either have to dig, which requires a lot of 
heavy equipment and you know earth moving to use the phrase loosely and the other thing is or you need to find a cave which is all very nice you know if there's a cave but who the hell knows if there's a cave you know yeah. the craters or something like that would be nice to find a cave that's already like volcanic so that it's sealed but that's you know eventually maybe we'll find those sorts of things but it, the to set something up before all this yeah. is, it, yeah, is but... it not is it not possible yeah. to find to identify caves from space using i don't know, radar or something like we have to go down there and actually prospect or can we do it from space uh, we've so... found caves on mars and the moon but i don't think we know like how deep are they what happens I you see. know see the cave so, open so so, so yeah. i'll, I'll... So this is Ron Turner. I'll comment briefly because I'm a huge fan of lava tubes on the moon eventually. And I, and the key word there is eventually, as, as Creon uh, points out. Um, uh, the physics of the uh, stability of lava tubes on the caves suggest, you know, that, on, that they could be 10 kilometers across underneath and totally stable. So there's the potential there for, you know, vast volume uh, in, inside these lava tubes. But until we know for sure, it's just speculation. As to where the lava tubes are, we got some pretty good clues from the skylights that uh, that form when an occasional, you know, cave-in happens along a lava tube. There's hundreds of lava tube sites identified. It, it's just a matter of let's go find one. Let's get inside it to confirm that there is, you know, stable and 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 as large and 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 useful because they could be too littered with debris to be, you know, to have it. Anyway, there's lots of complications. NILAC is funded through phase three, a study that, that, that tries to, you know, do a, a mission to, a, to one of the skylights to answer some of those questions. And there's other studies on cave diver concepts to go in. Um, but in the, one other thing is the lava tubes are generally mid to low latitude, not high latitude. But if you're really interested in going to the moon, there's very few of these caves uh, at high latitude. Anyway, I'm a big fan. I think that there's a feasibility there. Uh, they give you a benign thermal environment. They protect you from the radiation. It, lots of reasons, but it's an eventuality, not a near-term thing. We have Nat also with a question. Yeah. Hi, Aaron. Uh, thank you for that session. I'm super interested in the lunar economy and just love to learn in your opinion which one is going to be the largest share of the GDP, lunar GDP in a sense oh that's really hard to say because i also don't think i'm an expert but i think data and lunar resources when eventually you have the full supply chain established and you can actually sell it but data it's because it's quite easy for example you do experiments on the moon for a specific company on earth you give them data you don't need to transfer it. You don't spend your money on equipment or laundry, you know, to go from moon to earth. You just use internet, basically, and you send the data and you get money from that. Of course, you do experiments and you possibly, of course, use some equipment for this. But at the same time, you can use the same equipment for different kinds of experiments. So I think lunar data can be really interesting in the future. I'm not sure cool. if it's going to be like the biggest share of the GDP or whatever, but yeah. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Any other questions from the group? Okay. Right. Then I use the space uh, to, oh, wait. So Korean, did you want to ask something? So thank you, the speaker. Yeah. Thank you. It was a really fantastic presentation. And I guess one question that I always love to know is people are excited about your work and are excited about moving this field in general forward. Where would you... Um, try to direct people's energies uh, as you could. Direct people's energies. Oh, I have some ut utopia, let's say, <laughs> ideas where I want to see all the people working together on the same goal. As I said, Lena Earth, not we right now we have Artemis, of course, and Lunar Research Station from China. But at the same time, it would be nice, at least at some point of humanity history to see everyone working together. And I know that, of course, there are a lot of geopolitical strains right now, but if it would ever be possible to work together, it would be amazing. I want to ask, yeah. can, I, can I raise something about that? 
I understand them with the ISS. We have a similar problem, like the Chinese yeah. their own because of political missteps, arguably. But yeah, you know, another aspect is the more players that you have in these uh, collaborations, the yeah. slower they go and the more complicated they are, and you have multiple languages and multiple time zones and multiple competing interests. It might actually, we could look at this from a positive perspective. It might actually be advantageous to have kind of two competing groups trying to and settle them because that way they can try different things. They don't have to all come to an agreement. So unless yes. it's, I think it's just so expensive that there's no way for you know Artemis to do it without China or vice versa. But I don't think it is. I think that if we can take small steps in parallel, we don't have to be unfriendly just because we're doing different approaches, you know? Yeah, yeah, of course. It's actually the case with ESA, you know? They have a lot of member states and if, when they need to approve something in terms of the budget, yeah, you know, you're developing new technology or something, everyone should agree. And it's always complicated. At the same time, I think it's certainly everyone free to do what they want, to develop the technologies they want. What I really would like to see is how we share the information, how we cooperate with each other. It's possible to have several bases, but when you intentionally, you know, withhold the information or participating in a way, it's not because you want to achieve something, but because you want to be faster than someone else and you don't really thinking and having plans for long-term lunar exploration, that will be not good situation, you know? What I want to see is when, for example, right now you can see how people from NASA not always interact with people from China or any Chinese entities. Yeah, there are some concerns, but it would be nice to see in the future when people can find a way to interact on the most important topics for them and to share the progress not to withhold from each other, but that's utopia, I know, at least for the coming years. I think learning from each other, sharing progress, that should be achievable. Not a crazy ask. Thank you so much, Ekaterina. Thank you everyone for your amazing Thank questions. You so that was a really lively chat. Uh, thanks so much, Kian, for uh, for sharing and I hope to see you for the next one. Have a good one, everyone.